series in our church. We started last week. We're actually going to be moving through the book of Romans. There are some flyers, I believe, still out on the table if you want to invite some friends or family. And we're going to be in it for uh, quite a few months, right up until the summer. And we're going to be working Romans 1 through 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there. We'll see as we get a little closer. And so it's just, it's just nice to be studying through a book of the Bible together. I want to encourage you that for the most part, as we move into the future, we're going to be studying half a book at a time. So I know it took three, it'll take three uh, sermons to get through Romans chapter 1, but for the most part, there'll be two sermons on Romans 2, two sermons on 3, two sermons on 4. So, so about half the book at a time if you want to read along with the series and study the book of Romans together so that as, we, as you open it with me on Sabbath morning, you kind of get more of a blessing because you're, you're, you're catching it, you know, because you're read, you read it beforehand, and so that as we talk, it, it, it goes in deeper. And uh, so, you know, I encourage you to read along with us. And so if you want to read along next time, we're going to be studying uh, Romans chapter 1, and we'll be starting with verse 18 and going until the end of the chapter for next week's sermon, for next week's sermon. Let's have a word of prayer and invite God's presence to be with us. The fact that we need the Holy Spirit, our Father, is not contested by anyone here. We tremble at the opening of your word because your thoughts, your heart, your passion, your emotions are expressed. And Lord, we want to know you and we want to know your son, and we want to know your salvation, and we want your spirit to speak to us today so that your words would just come through and ring loud and clear. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 1. Today we're going to begin reading with verse 8. I will read right through our section, then we will go back and talk about it slowly. The book of Romans chapter 1, and once again, we'll begin with verse 8. And of course, if you don't have a Bible, you weren't able to bring one with you today, or you forgot yours, there are plenty of Bibles in the seats in front of you. Feel free to use one of our Bibles today. Uh, They are the New King James Version. They actually match the Bible that I have up front, so that as I read and share, you will be able to see the same words that I am reading. The book of Romans, chapter 1, and we'll begin with verse 8, and I will read all the way through to verse 17. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Man, beautiful passage of scripture. Let's go back and look at verse 8. The first thing that struck me when I began to read these scriptures in the book of Romans chapter 1 is that Paul was really a pastor. He really was a pastor. Anybody here have a favorite pastor in your life? Uh, You know, I'm sure that each of you have had many good pastors, but is there one pastor that really stands out to you? You know, is there one pastor that, that in your lifetime just has made the difference in your life spiritually? They visited you. They prayed with you. They cared about you. In the moments when you really needed it, there was a pastor there for you. Anybody here had that experience? 
Many of us have, haven't you? I have a pastor who uh, made an impact on my life. It was Pastor David Berthew. He was the pastor that baptized me. He was the pastor of the church in Quinnebog, Connecticut. When I became a member there, when I walked in at 19 years old, um, a drug addict and a, and a mess, with my messed up life, and I walk in, and this is the pastor that ministered to me. Now, I'll tell you that he wasn't perfect. You know, shock, you know, should cross all of you. Pastor, that's not perfect? Yes. Most pastors are not perfect. <laughs> Actually, all pastors not perfect. <laughs> but this pastor, like all pastors, not being perfect, he wasn't a very good preacher. I, uh, you know, and, and I'm not saying that to hurt him or that just wasn't his thing. Preaching wasn't his expertise. It was visiting. He was a visitor. And he was out, and he would be driving through your area and think, you know what, I'm going to stop by and just see how they're doing. And he would just show up at your house. And you'd open the door and say, who's here, you know, at 7 o'clock at night? And there would be Pastor B. That's what we called him, Pastor Berthew and Pastor B. Pastor B, how you doing? Come on in. And he would just, he just had a heart for people. He was the most loving, the kind, and it was exactly when I needed at that time of my life, just that compassion. But not every pastor is the same. Have you noticed through the years that some pastors may be really good at preaching, but not as good at other things? There are some pastors that are great administrators, but maybe they're not good, as good as evangel evangelism. There are some pastors that are great at evangelism, but maybe they're not very good people, you know, people persons. We're just all different, but we all make an impact in our giftedness for God. What I realized as I read this passage of scripture is that Paul had a pastor's heart. Now, I mean, that shouldn't surprise us, but we always lift up Paul so high, we think of him as the great apostle, the evangelist, you know, the one who went forward and, and, and you know, was shipwrecked. And we, you know, we read all the stories being snake bit and, and adventure and you know, all these different things that he went through, being beaten and whipped and singing in the prison and being broken out. But in the end... As I read Romans chapter 1, 8 through 17, I realized that we are reading about a pastor who thought as a pastor and cared as a pastor. Notice verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The whole world. Now, by the way, as I think about this verse, the first thing that comes to mind is when Paul talks about their faith being known throughout the whole world, he can't mean among people who do not believe. He can't really mean that the people in China know the faith of the, of the little tiny Christian church in Rome. He can't be meaning that the people in Athens, that the general public, general population of Athens know about the faith of this little tiny church in Rome because we're talking about, we're talking about a, a movement that has just begun. There are small churches and cities scattered throughout Asia, and now there's a small church in Rome, and Paul is writing to them. So what he means when he says that their faith is known throughout the whole world, he's talking about all the churches in the known world. All the Christians in the known world, they know of the faith of that little group that's in Rome. They're familiar with it. All the churches know, all those people know about the passion and the faith of those who are living in Rome. And by the way, it's interesting in this verse that Paul gives us an idea that faith is not something that is generated something that comes from inside of us, I notice that the first thing he does is he thanks God for their faith. Which means that faith must be a gift from God. Now most of us, when we think of faith, think of, I have so little faith. I've heard that many times. Oh, but pastor, I have so little faith. And, and, and it sounds like I'm trying to have more faith, but I'm not very good at it. Anybody ever feel that way, that they're trying to have faith and they're not very good at it? Paul here is giving a different idea. Paul is saying faith is from God because he's giving thanks to God for their faith, as though God gave it to them. Does that make sense what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, in the same book, in the Romans chapter 12, verse 3, if you just flip over to Romans chapter 12, verse 3, Paul is going to give this same idea that faith is really a gift from God. 
book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 3. We'll study Romans 12 a lot later. <laughs> Hopefully we'll do it this year. Romans 12, 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to everyone who is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a what? Measure faith. So according to Paul, we shouldn't think too much of ourselves. Oh, I'm a faithful Christian. I'm really good at this, you know. I believe in God and I have great faith. You shouldn't think too highly of yourself because God gave you that measure of faith. And by the way, there are some here that think, well, God really messed up because he only gave me a little bit. <laughs> you know, a measure is a measure. And he has given to each one a measure of faith. Now, it, now it sounds to me like you want to say, but it's a measurement. And I don't know what happened to his measuring cup when he was measuring out mine. But it's too, too little. <laughs> it should be more for me. God has given us enough faith for several things. Let me tell you what he's given us enough faith for. Number one, God has given us enough faith to believe in his son. He's given us enough faith so that all of us can experience salvation through Jesus Christ. He's given us enough faith so that we can experience the joy of salvation and the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. He's given us enough faith so that we can use our gifts for his glory. And he's given us enough faith to be able to witness for his name. In other words, he's given us enough faith for everything we need. And so when we say, oh, I don't have enough faith, what we're saying is God cheated you somehow. God didn't cheat you. He's given you enough. Now, you, the, the amount really doesn't matter. All we have to know is that he has given us enough faith for everything we need. And God gets all the glory for it. God gets all the glory for it. So number one... My first thought in this whole passage as we're reading through is that God has given each one of us the gift of faith, and it's just a beautiful thing. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. I want you to notice, first of all, that Paul is here taking an oath. Now, there are some that believe that you shouldn't swear by anything, but here, basically, Paul is saying, God is my witness. I swear by God who watches me, who watches over me. I swear, he says, that I am praying for you always. That's what I meant when I said that he has a pastor's heart. Because he is, he, he is praying for his churches. He is praying for his people. And isn't it interesting that Paul feels the urge to convince them I'm praying for you. Why? Because obviously there would be some doubt in people's mind about whether Paul is really praying or not. I mean, if he has to say, I want you to know with God as my witness that I really am praying for you, it's because there might be some doubt in those who he's writing to that he really prays. Now, I know here that if any of us say, I'm going to pray for you, that we really do pray. I mean, we wouldn't be like those people that would say, I'm going to pray for you and then not pray, right? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. But have you ever said, I'm going to pray for you? And then three days later, you remember, <gasps> right? The, the thing that you were going to pray for happened like a day ago. And all of a sudden, like, okay, God, I know, I don't know what happened, and I was supposed to pray two days ago, but I'm praying today for the thing that happened yesterday. <laughs> You've never done that before, right? <laughs> Paul knows the weakness of human nature. By the way, Paul's human here. And what he wants to convince them is, I want them to, he says, I want you to know, as God is my witness, that I really do pray for you every day because I care. He's saying, I love you. It can only come out of a heart of love. And this pastor saying, I love you with passion, and I want you to know, and I want you to be convinced that I really do pray for you every single day, and it comes from my heart that it's the real thing. Verse 10, making request, if by some means, now at last, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. What was he praying? 
He's praying, I want to go, God. I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Rome. Why? Because Rome was the capital of, of the known world. Rome was the place where the leadership of that, of that time, Rome conquered most of the known world at that time, all of Europe and even into North Africa. Rome was the ruler of that land. And so Paul wanted to be in Rome because then he could have influence on leaders and people that would affect an entire nation. Paul wanted to go and preach at Rome so much because he wanted to make a difference. But I want you to notice something. He's praying in verse 10, and he's making requests to God if some way he can find a way, and notice this word, in the will of God to go to Rome. What does that mean? It means that Paul didn't go just because he wanted to go. He was only going to go if God said to him, go. Now, we do a lot of things that we want to do just because we want to do them. But Paul here is giving insight into how he made decisions for his life. And here the scripture is telling us that Paul, just because he wanted to go to Rome, by the way, would it be a good thing for him to go to Rome? Sure. Would he be able to affect positively the church? Sure, isn't he one of the apostles, the great preachers, the great builders of the church during this early church period? Sure. Don't you think he would be a positive influence on Rome? I'm sure that he could think of a hundred reasons why it would be a good idea for him to go to Rome. But did he go? No. Because God hadn't said yes to him yet. You know, sometimes we do good things just because they're good. But just because they're good things doesn't mean that God wants us to be doing those things. I'm guilty of this too, myself in my own life. I make decisions, and then later on I regret them. Even though they were good things, I look back on it and I go, man, I wish I hadn't done that. And then I realize at some point that I really didn't ask God if he wanted me to do it because I thought, oh, it's a good thing. He must want me to do it. Right? Hey, I mean, why would God say no? This is a wonderful thing for my life. This would be so positive for me. I'm sure Paul had many good reasons to go to Rome, but he would not go without God's will. Do you know what God's will is for your life? Do you know where God wants you to be and what he wants you to be doing? Or are you just living your life doing good things because they're good things? Are you living in God's will? Or are you just living? I, I think there is a need in the church today for people who would be willing to do what God wanted them to do versus just what is a good thing to do. There's a need today for more people who would seek out and spend the more time, and I'm guilty of it, spend more time of figuring out, God, what do you want us to do rather than just doing what we think are just good ideas? Do you know what God wants you to be doing. If you don't, find out. Take the time to ask. Paul is saying, I prayed, and I prayed every single day that God would release me to go to Rome, but so far, he said no. Do you know what God wants you to be doing? Hmm. He continues, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. So he's saying, the reason I want to go to you is because I believe I have something to add. He says, I believe that my spiritual gifts will be a blessing. By the way, are you using your spiritual gifts? Are you edifying and blessing the church? You know, we, I, you know, I, as a pastor, appreciate that you come every week and you keep my seats warm. Warm seats are a wonderful thing, and it's much better than a cold, empty church. So it's beautiful to have you here all keeping everything warm. But are you using your spiritual gifts to edify the body? Paul's goal about going to Rome and joining that church and being a part of that church is because he wanted to add something to that church. Are you adding to your church? Are you finding a way to be involved? By the way, there are many, many, many more job descriptions then we have people to fill them. 
And, and you know what's amazing is that when everybody, whenever anybody comes to us as staff and says, Pastor, I want to serve in some way, somehow a position or a place or a job or something opens up that fits them perfectly. Why? Because God has a place for every one of you in his church. And he wants you to serve and he wants you to be involved. And so that place is there waiting for you to say, I want to serve. I want to be involved. I want to do something. God's church would be so effective if each person would just do what they were called to do with their spiritual gifts in God's church. It would make a huge difference. Verse 12. That is, he says, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of, of both you and me. I'll read it again. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. What Paul is saying here, the Apostle Paul is saying, I know that if I go to Rome, not only am I going to bless you, but Paul is saying here that I know that I will be blessed by you. You think, what could they teach the Apostle Paul? I mean, what could any of those church members new in Christ show him? The great apostle was an evangelist and traveled and taught and, and, and raised up a church. You know, what, what could the Apostle Paul be taught by them. That's, the way, that's not the way Paul thought. Paul understood that no matter how long he was in Christ, he continued to grow in Christ. And Paul understood that being in the presence of believers means not only do you teach, but you are also taught. As a pastor, I am constantly humbled and constantly being taught by my churches. Every time I think I know what I should be doing or I think I know something, I learn that I really don't know it as good as I ought to. And all of a sudden, I know it better. And every church I go into, I find spiritual leaders who end up being such a huge blessing on my life that I grow spiritually and emotionally. And, and not just my staff, because, you know, we have a great connection, whether it's Pastor Albert or Celeste. Or, it's not just the staff working together. I just mean the church itself blesses us as leaders, as spiritual leaders. That each one of us receives a blessing by working with you. You bless us. You teach us. And we are constantly learning and constantly humbled. Not that we like being humbled, but it happens. <laughs> It's unavoidable. Verse 13. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you just as among the other Gentiles. It's interesting to me that one of the discussions that are had about the church of Rome is what kind of church was in Rome if Paul hadn't been there yet. Now, tradition says that it might have been Peter who went there first or, and, and preached to Rome or one of the other apostles. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But this was a church of Gentiles. Well, how do you know? Because Paul just said that he wanted to go so that he could have the same influence, the same fruit, as in that last sentence it says, just as among the other Gentiles. Now, if he says, I want to have fruit among you like I've had with the other Gentiles, then who are they that he's writing to? It's a Gentile church. A Christian church made up of Gentile believers. And so Paul says, hey, look, I'm excited to be able to come to you. I want to come to you because there's a Gentile church there in Rome, and he wants to bless them and build them up and have an influence on them. He wants to preach the gospel to them that they have not heard yet. Verse 14, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Isn't it an interesting concept here? He says, I'm a debtor. And the idea is that if you're a debtor, it means that you owe money to somebody. Anybody here a debtor? Oh, most of you. You know what a debtor is? It means you owe somebody money. Anybody here owe anybody money? Oh, okay, there's a few of you. If you're not, God bless you. I'll send you my 
yes, no. <laughs> I'm not going there. If you're not a debtor, call me. I'll, I can help you if you need help with that. No, that's God's way that he wants us to, he wants us to be free. And so God bless you for that. But most of us are debtors. And when you owe somebody, the Bible says that if you owe somebody, you are a slave to them. Did you know that? It's a type of slavery. Why? Because you owe them something. And if you have nothing of worth to pay, then you owe them yourself. As a matter of fact, in olden times, we don't do that anymore. But if you owed somebody and you sold your home, and you sold all your furniture, and you sold your barn, and you still couldn't pay back the debt, the person could take your children and your wife and even yourself and sell you and treat you as slaves so that you could work off the debt. They would own you. That's why the Bible says that when you owe somebody and you're a debtor, you're a slave to them. Because ultimately, they have a right to your life by being in debt to them. Does that shock you? I hope it shocks us enough to not want to be in debt as much as possible. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So what is Paul saying? He says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians. What is he saying? I'm enslaved to you. I owe you my life. And you must think to yourself, how does Paul owe them anything? He didn't take any loans from them. Paul had a concept in his mind that that we don't have. You see, in America, we have a very individualistic idea of life. In other words, we have an idea of this is my house, and this is my property, and these are my things, and this is my life, and this is my time. Please don't mess with it. And we build walls around ourselves in, in American individualistic culture. We build walls around ourselves. But here Paul is saying, I don't have anything that doesn't belong to someone else, even my own life. That I am indebted to the world. I'm indebted to barbarians. I'm indebted to Greeks, and I owe them my life. And so therefore I serve, and I visit, and I pastor, and I preach because I owe them myself. Now, where would he get this idea of, of, of him being a slave to all people? How would he have the idea that he owed the world something? Paul had this idea because of what Jesus did for him. You see, because he had a debt that was so large he could not pay it on his own. It was called his sin. And Jesus paid the price with his blood. And so because of that, he was indebted to Christ. And the Bible says that when we are indebted to Christ, we are indebted to the world. Because we realize that others also, all around us, are in the same place as us. And so Paul wanted to preach to them so that they might know the freedom that was in Christ. He was indebted to the gospel and he was indebted to all people to preach it and to share it as much as possible. I'm a debtor to both Greeks and barbarians, both to wise and unwise. In other words, he was not a respecter of persons. He preached to everyone the same. Verse 15 so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He's been ready for a while, by the way. He was just waiting for God to, to say go <laughs> so that he could go. He's been ready for some time. Let's go to our next verse, verse 16. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. By the way, kids, what's our word for today? Gospel. That's right. So every time I say gospel, you want to write that down. Gospel, 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 gospel. Did you get all that? I hope so. I haven't done that in a while to you, but it was just that, that there was a lot of pleasure in that. I want to remember to do that more. So, in verse 16, we get to the core of what we are reading today. The core passage, 16 and 17, that we want to spend our time talking about. Because these words are, are, this is one of those verses that you should memorize. These are one of those verses that you should have by memory in your, in your arsenal of, of scripture. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. By the way, why would he need to say, I am not ashamed? 
Because there is the potential for shame, isn't there? If there was no potential for shame, would he need to mention it? Okay, so who is he afraid of being ashamed before? Other Christians and other church people? No, because we all believe alike. Are you ashamed to say that you're a Christian here today? If you're here in church, okay? It's probably because you in some way believe in Jesus Christ or in some way today you're here for a reason, a spiritual reason. And so you're not ashamed because you're already in the church. But it's different when you're in the workplace, isn't it? Do you work in a public school system? Is it so easy to profess your Christianity and your love for Jesus Christ? It's not as easy, isn't it? If you work in, in construction and you're on a crew with 50 other guys and they're cursing and they're doing things that you wouldn't normally do, is it easy to confess your love for Jesus Christ and to share with them the word of God? Is that easy? No. You see, what Paul is saying is that there is a temptation, not in the church, but there's a temptation out there to be ashamed of who we are. It was even a temptation to Paul. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it. Do you understand that? It was a temptation even to him to be ashamed of the gospel. But he wanted you to know that he was not ashamed of it. In other words, he was making a decision in his mind. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Even though I could be, I am not. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ? Do you, do you have the confidence in all that Jesus has done for you to be able to share his name with others, to share his word with others. Paul did. He says, I am not ashamed. The world will see no value in it, the gospel. The world will see it as foolishness, and anybody who believes in it is a fool. I don't remember which great philosopher said it, but religion is the opium or opiate? Thank you, of the masses. In other words, it's a, it's a drug. It, it just makes people happy. It makes them calm, but it's all a lie. They just take it to, to be at peace. That's what people believe outside of the church, that religion is just a drug so that you can be happy. No different than, than any other, anything else. The second thing that we read in this passage is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, so it's the gospel of who? Now, we talked last time we were together a week ago that the gospel is what? It's Jesus. And so how, now we have, again, the same idea. It is the good news of Jesus. <laughs> and Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus. And so emphasizing that once again, the good news of Jesus, we're going to get more qualifying statements about the gospel. We're going to understand it a little better because Paul's going to give us a little bit more information. He says, number one, the gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation. Now, the word power there is dynamite. That's what it means in the Greek. It's God's dynamite power. Boom! You know how powerful dynamite is. You wouldn't be around it if it blew up, right? The Bible says the gospel is that powerful. It's like dynamite power. It is the power of God unto what? Salvation. In other words, the gospel is strong enough and powerful enough to save people. Do you believe that today? Now, let me tell you a secret. Most people I talk to about the gospel believe it's powerful enough to save others. But most of us struggle with whether it's really powerful enough to save us. Am I right? Isn't it easy to believe that God is powerful enough to save other people? But when it comes to saving me, I don't know about that. Is God strong enough to save me? I'm messed up. The problem is that most of us think that other people are pretty good and I'm the only messed up person in the world. Right? That's how most of us think. But you know what? The other person is thinking the same thing, that everybody's pretty good and they're the only ones that's messed up. And, and, and by the way, to surprise you, most people think that you're pretty good and that they're the only person that's messed up. Did you know that? Even though you're thinking to yourself right now, I'm the only one that's messed up and everybody else is pretty good. But that's the way we all think. And so that's why we struggle with the gospel applied to me. Because the gospel applied to me is so much harder to believe. 
Because we know ourselves and we know what we do and we know how we think and we know how we act and then we think everybody else there's power enough for, but me, I'm not sure. I'm just not sure. I've sat in a lot of Sabbath school classes where we had discussions about the the gospel and salvation and heard so many people talk about themselves as though they were not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's strong enough. Let me tell you today with confidence that Jesus is strong enough to save. It is his dynamite power. It is his death. It is his life that saves. It's all Jesus. He has done the work already. And the Bible says the way to receive that finished work is by believing. Notice it says it right here in the verse we're reading. It says, for it is the power of God to salvation for who? For who? For who? Come on, everybody? Does that mean everybody in this room? Does that mean everybody in this city? That's right. It's everyone who believes. It is the power of God. Jesus is able to save. Do you believe it today? Able to save you? Amen. Able able to save me? Amen. Amen. We put it on us somehow. We We make it some kind of burden to bear. Jesus bore the burden. He he did the work with his life, death, and resurrection. And he applies that salvation to us when we believe in his name. And there is power in what Jesus did. Power enough to save human beings. Wretched, miserable human beings like you and me. There's enough power to save us. It's a beautiful thing. For everyone who believes, and then he has to say for the Jew first, and then for the Greek. By the way, this first has always confused people. This Jew first and then for the Greek. It isn't an order of preeminence. It isn't an order of priority when he says first. It isn't an order of, of, of um, b- priority or preference or any of that. It is an order of timing. When he says first, he's not saying that the Jews, they get first dibs at salvation as though they have the priority, like there's only so many spots and they get the front seat. (laughs) You know, it's not like there's a plane and it's got 100 seats and the Jews get the first pick. And then we got the leftovers. It's in order of timing because the gospel came to the Jews first and was preached to them first in the Old Testament. Because in timing, the Gentiles heard the gospel second. But Abraham got it first. Paul will tell us that Abraham was preached the gospel. You know, David was preached the gospel. We can read through the scripture and find over and over again that the gospel was preached in the Old Testament and it was preached to Jews first. But but friends, it's for the Greeks too. And, And by the way, we may have learned it second, but praise God we learned it. And so today, the gospel is being preached to the whole world. The gospel is being preached to the whole world. It's good news. Verse 17. For in it, what's it? The, we're still talking about the gospel. We haven't stopped yet. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What is revealed in the gospel? The righteousness of who? Righteous, not the righteousness of man, right? Not the righteousness of man. It isn't the good works of people that's being revealed in the gospel. It isn't how good you and I perform that's being revealed in the gospel. It's the righteousness of God that's being revealed in the gospel. It's God's righteousness that is being shown to the world in the gospel. Why? Because the gospel is who? The gospel is Jesus. And so do we see in Jesus the righteousness of God? Absolutely we do. His life is the righteousness of God because he was God. That's why only Jesus could come down to the earth and show us what God's righteousness was because he was God and is God and will always be God. And so therefore Jesus could show us this is what God is like. This is who God is. And when God is in these kind of situations, this is how God responds. 
And this is how God feels about people. And this is how God feels about little children when they come to him with their mothers. And this is how God feels about lepers who are all messed up and their skin is diseased and everybody else runs away from them. But this is how God feels about lepers. He reaches out and touches them. This is how God feels about, and all the way through Jesus' life, you are seeing God's righteousness portrayed. In uh, the book of John, there's this whole discussion in there where one of the disciples says to him, show us the Father. And, and Jesus says, don't you get it? If you have seen me, you have seen God. I mean, he says the Father, but that's what he was saying. If you have seen me, you have seen God's righteousness. You have seen God's righteousness. In the gospel, God's righteousness is being revealed, not the righteousness of men. You see, we tend to look at people in this world, in this life. We tend to look at people to decide what is good and what isn't. We will tend to even look at really good people and decide what is good and what isn't. You know, we look at people like Mother Teresa and we think, wow, what a person. You know, gave her life to, to leper colonies, served at, at the detriment even of her own life. I mean, just an amazing person. We could go through and think of person after person, even pastors. We tend to look at pastors and think of righteousness. Wow, that pastor, he was so good and he was so faithful and he's so honest and blah, blah, blah. But there is only one righteousness that's revealed in the gospel. And it isn't your righteousness and it's not mine. It's God's righteousness. And that righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying we're good or bad. That's not the point. The point is that in the gospel, the only righteousness that matters is the righteousness that comes through Jesus. That's the only one that matters. And by the way, it's the most beautiful one. It's the most beautiful one. Because you know what? If we were to stand up and tell people to look at me and my righteousness, if I make a mistake, then everybody's going to be disappointed. But Jesus will never make a mistake. When you look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, you will find the salvation and hope that you need in Christ. It is not found in us. It's not found in another person. We get so disappointed when other people fall because maybe we were looking at them and saying, that's righteousness, and it's not. It is the righteousness of God. Now, by the way, later on in Romans, we're going to find out that God's righteousness is given freely to us. And that's a beautiful thing. But it's still God's righteousness, it's not ours. See, we get confused sometimes because we think when God's righteousness applies to us, people start thinking it's our righteousness. And it's not, it's God's. He still gets all the glory and the honor. And it still belongs to Jesus. And so when people see us living a different life, a loving, kind, gracious, long-suffering, patient life, and they think, wow, what a wonderful person, it's still Jesus. Because we know ourselves. We know that we are not kind and loving and joyful and good and long-suffering and self-controlled and all those. That we got none of that. We know how we are. Impatient, quick to anger, jealous, proud, contentious, gossipers, thieves, liars. Am I telling it wrong? We know who we are. So if anything good comes out of us, it has to be Jesus. So even in the gospel where God's righteousness is revealed, it is still Jesus Christ and not us. He gets all the glory from beginning to end. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed how is it revealed? From faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live. Notice the application now. It has gone beyond God's righteousness as something that was in Jesus. But now Paul is saying that something happens when you have faith in Christ. And what happens when you have faith in Christ? All of a sudden, God's righteousness is no longer something that's only over there in God. Now where do we find God's righteousness? find it in people because of faith to faith the just those the just are those who have received God's righteousness they live by faith those who have received Christ's righteousness have it because of faith you know don't don't miss this powerful point 
This is the very, this phrase, the just shall live by faith, is the phrase that took Martin Luther off his knees as he was climbing the steps doing penance. This is the phrase that caused his mind to open and the Reformation began. This is the book that transformed his thinking and understanding about who God was and it turned the world upside down. Don't miss the point that not only is the gospel the righteousness of God, but the gospel is the righteousness of God that when we believe, we receive the righteousness of God. Not because we're good, not because we've done any better than anybody else, but simply because God gives it as a gift to you, to me, to anyone who believes, whether you're a barbarian or a Greek or a Jew or anybody, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're male or female, when you believe in God, you begin to live by the righteousness of God instead of your own righteousness. Suddenly the righteousness of God, so beautiful and so perfect, found in Jesus Christ, is given to you poor example of righteousness. Then all of a sudden people begin to notice because you're changed from the inside. Something's different about you. You have more peace. You have more patience. Something's different about you because Jesus is in your life, because God has given you his righteousness. Suddenly you're not angry as quickly. Suddenly the things that you care about have changed. You care more about the things of God. Suddenly sermons are not so boring. Suddenly you study your Sabbath school lesson, not because you have to, but because you want to. Suddenly the same verses in the Bible that you couldn't read because you would fall asleep halfway through all of a sudden are so interesting and alive that your heart is beating. That your mind is just enthralled with it. Suddenly there's something different about you and it's not you. It's faith in Jesus Christ and his righteousness in your life. That you are being changed and transformed by that very righteousness into God's image. When, when, when Luther heard the words on his knees, the just shall live by faith. He understood that it was not his righteousness that made God happy, but it was the righteousness of God that made God happy. And that righteousness was found in Jesus. And he got up off his knees and he understood for the first time clearly that it wasn't about him at all, that it was about his God and Savior. And he began to preach it with fire. And it turned the world upside down. Know with confidence today. Know with confidence today today that God has enough power to save. And that power of the gospel is found in the righteousness of God and what Jesus did in his life, death, and resurrection. And not only is it it in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, but that power is applied to your life when you believe. And so that you can live a different life, a new life, a powerful life in Jesus Christ. We're going to read later on in Romans 6 and other places where it makes these profound statements so that you are no longer a slave of sin, but you become a slave of righteousness. Not your righteousness, but God's righteousness. And you read these verses over and over again, and you realize that Romans is trying to tell us that if we want change and transformation, it starts with faith in Christ, and then our lives change. How many today? desire faith in Christ. How many today would like to raise their hand and say, Lord, I want your righteousness, not mine. I want to experience the righteousness that you give and not my own. Praise the Lord. God's righteousness is available to all who will believe on Jesus Christ today. It is simple, and yet even now our hearts resist it because to receive it by faith means that we actually have to enter into the experience of Christ with him. And for some reason, our hearts are at enmity with God, and we constantly run away from it. But today, understand the simplicity of it. God is calling you to come to him and receive his righteousness in place of your own dirty rags, to receive his beautiful life in exchange for your messed up life. He wants to exchange his mighty power in place of your decrepit weakness. He wants to exchange his awesome character for your shortcomings, failings, and sin. He wants to exchange his goodness for your wickedness. 
and he wants to make that exchange with you clean and clear. He'll take it from you if you will take his from him. Who wants to make that trade today? I do. Like, okay, Lord, sounds good to me. I would make that trade. Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Kneel as far as, as possible with me this morning. Our God and our Father, there are so many wonderful lessons for us to learn from your scripture. The first thing that we learned this morning, Lord, is that we can come with confidence to you because you gave your son Jesus to us to save us. We have nothing to fear, Lord, because your love shines through the gospel as we read. When we realize, Lord, how, how frail we are, we look for your strength. And when we understand how needy we are, Lord, we look for your grace and your gift. Today, Lord, we are willing to give up our wretched lives to receive your perfect life. We are ready to give up our rags of righteousness that we might receive the perfect spotless robe that you have prepared for us, God, in Jesus Christ. Clothe us, take away our mess, and replace it with your beauty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.